Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Today's episode is a double doctor episode. We have two PhDs. Larry Sanger is a co-founder of Wikipedia, and he's now the chief information officer at Everipedia. Those guys are our friends. We love their mission. They've been on the show before, too. And Larry's vision of free speech aligns perfectly. He's laid out his free speech credo, which includes the ideas that popular safe speech needs no protection, that free speech needs protection precisely because and to the extent extent that it bothers, annoys, dismays, infuriates, emotionally wounds, and yes, offends other people, and that to oppose free speech is to favor censorship. Those are his words, and we definitely respect them, and his voice is unusual in the tech world. Also on today is Dr. Tim Furnish, who is a many times guest of our show, whose speech and ideas challenge me, sometimes infuriate me, and I love him for it. He leads with facts and crafts great arguments that demand consideration. He's a dear friend of the show, and any place where he lends his formidable brain power is better for it. We're very lucky he's chosen to be generous with it to us, and we'll have him on as much as he's available to do it. So we hope you enjoy this rich discussion of why we get so uncomfortable with the expression of views that oppose our own and why they deserve to be heard and examined with our guests, Dr. Larry Sanger and Dr. Tim Furnish. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan Easton. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Larry Sanger. I am the CIO of Everpedia, and welcome to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, this is interesting. We've got Larry here, who obviously is the CIO of Everpedia, probably most notable for being one of the co-founders of a little thing called Wikipedia. And mm-hmm. then we also have co-hosting, and, and gosh, Tim, how many times have you been on the show now? At least 10 times. Uh, Dr. Probably Tim, eight, eight of those were albums, I think. Well, album fights count, man. That, that's <laughs> still being on the show. But this is your first time co-hosting, so Dr. Tim Furnish, and we're going to have a, a pretty interesting conversation because... Dr. Tim has been shadow banned. Uh, both of these guys are experts in their field at a very high level, and both believe in freedom of speech and, and being smart and having having opinions that matter. So I thought we might just kind of discuss, Tim, let's just, I want to get started with your shadow banning on Facebook, and I can't for the life of me figure out what the heck you did. Yes, at times you post things that can be uncomfortable for people, but I don't know what you did this time. <laughs> and you? that's the thing. I don't know what I did either, Pete. And I've made, by my last count, eight queries to Facebook saying, would you explain what I did? And seven of them, the responses were the generic, um, you know, I don't know if it was a human or not. It was a generic response. Once I got a response from a person with a name who said that, let me see if I can remember how they put it to me, um, that I had used uh, a Facebook feature, which they did not name, in a manner that some people would might consider or could consider abusive, even if I didn't intend to. That was the uh, Orwellian uh, explanation of what I'd done wrong. <laughs> as near as I can ascertain, yeah, and you're right. I mean, I post a lot of stuff on Islam, and, and, and I try to be careful about only posting factual things, uh, like, for instance, factual articles about how violence in Islamic countries ramps up during Ramadan, which, as you said, makes some people uncomfortable, but uh, inconvenient truths are that. As near as I can tell, back in April, it seems to have been after I posted a photo, a family photo that we took when we went to England last year, my family and I, of King Richard the Lionheart, that statue in front of Parliament, with him on horseback holding a sword up. How dare you? Yes, I don't know. After that, that seems to have uh, that seems to have struck a nerve with with an algorithm or with a human or both at Facebook, and ever since then. it seems like that the only person that can actually see things from my feed is my wife, which I guess is good. But uh, I do have an audience of my wife at home, so I hope to reach a little larger audience on social media. And so uh, nothing shows. The only way I can get things to show now is to put things as my cover photo. And I'm using that as a stealth way to get around. If, but they won't explain it to me. I don't know what it is. And I'm probably going to have to wind up once I extract all the football pictures of my sons off of there, I'm probably going to delete the account and try to start over. 
And, and I, I'll confirm, I've looked at your account every day since we first started talking about that, and you're absolutely, your posts are not being shown in a way that anybody would recognize as normal. Right. Absolutely. No, they're not. They're not. Absolutely. And I've been on Facebook for 10 years, Pete. This is the first time this has happened, so I don't understand. I thought all the people Weird. that liked me had already unfriended me, so I don't know what happened. Which leads me so to think I, it's, not, it's not from someone in my feed. It's from Facebook itself. Larry, you were going to say something? I was just going to react to that. I mean, it, it seems clear to me that, that uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter and all the rest, they, they don't respond anymore at least in many cases, to particular problematic posts, right? They don't even seem to feel they need to have a specific evidence to ban people. You know, there's been enough uh, reporting and evidence about how the, the big social media companies operate in their uh, moderation operations that, that uh, it's, it's, it's clear. We're expecting that they behave more or less rationally. In other words, uh, according to rules, so that uh, if somebody is shadow banned or if somebody is blocked, then it must be in response to some specific thing they did on the platform. But I don't think that's the case anymore. I think that there's, uh, I mean, maybe it was once that way, mm. and that's how it ought to be. But it sounds to me like uh, if, if there isn't any other reason, the most reasonable or other reason given rather by by uh, Facebook for shadow banning you, I would expect that it, there's an actual deliberation going on behind the scenes in which they're talking about different bad actors, people who they have political objections to. Mm -hmm. There are spreadsheets and, and they... they uh, you know, tally things up, and uh, you know, once your your time is up, and and uh, the person is looking at your case, uh, they make a decision about uh, what what to do about your case. They look at things that that you've written online. Again, this is I'm this is all speculative. I'm just speculating here, um, uh, but only slightly speculative because right. again, we have seen reporting about uh, about how it operates. So, Larry, yeah, you're I, saying it sort of reaches a critical mass, and they say, okay, this they we've seen enough from these people. We don't want to hear from them anymore. We don't want to allow them to amplify what they believe anymore. Right. Well, that's what I think. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's what's been going on, especially recently. Of mm -hmm. course, in the last few years, that that's how. But, but um, I think uh, it seems to have been kicked up a notch in the last few months. Yeah. What's interesting is that I've never had a lot. I've never had a problem on Twitter. I've got several thousand followers on Twitter, and mm -hmm. I think, and Pete, you follow me on Twitter. Sure. I probably put more uh, abrasive stuff, uh, more inflammatory stuff on Twitter than I do on Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, and I've never had a problem on Facebook as opposed to a lot of people that uh, you know that, that that I've seen that have. Yeah. And there's a, a problem too when we have these. So Peter Van Buren, who's a whistleblower, and and. Likes to straddle the line on uncomfortable topics. I like him. I think he's a nice guy. Uh, he's been on the show a couple of times. We both worked in Iraq together, so we go we go really far back. But uh, he's been banned forever on Twitter, oh, and gosh. and partly because he's not afraid to jump into the fray when being attacked and swing back. I mean, if you pick and, and Tim will appreciate this as a guy that likes a sword fight, you pick up your gauntlet and smack me across the face with it, then you know I get to fight, but. It's not right. a fight. It's it's a bait. Start a fight, and then you run, and you tell mom, and then mom bans you forever. Yeah. There's something that that uh, might be related, perhaps. Um, you know that that after the New Zealand mosque mass massacre in March, I, I, I think it was New Zealand proposed uh, basically rules be accepted by different countries. Um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, UK, and so forth, to uh, stamp out hate speech online. So the uh, it, it's been called the Christ Christchurch call to action, mm -hmm. right? And now I'm looking at uh, talkingpointsmemo.com and a story about this. So basically, they they said that tech companies and governments worldwide 
need to do more to prevent the spread of internet hate content, which leads to radicalization and in the case of the mosque shootings, mass violence. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's not just activists that are behind this now. I think it's it's uh, big establishment players and and the corporations are responding. So I, I think it's fairly clear that that's what, what's happening. I mean, that's what reports. I think you're right, Larry, but what's what I find, of course, incredibly ironic and striking since I'm I, I'm in the field of Islamic studies is that there is one group whose ideology is uh, more equal than others, right? There was not a similar movement when 300 Christians were gunned down in Sri Lanka or bombed and gunned down in Sri Lanka churches for a stop the hate against Christians who by just about any metric that anybody has put out, including leftist groups, uh, Christians are the most persecuted people on the face of the planet. We don't see any like multi-transnational, multi-government, multi-ethnic, multi-entity movement to protect Christians from hate speech. But yet Islam is protected from ha alleged hate speech. I mean, it's, I just find it ludicrous. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can't, can't disagree. The other thing that bothers me in this whole thing is, is uh, in this case, since we're talking about Tim, he actually is an expert in his field and gets to talk about, he's a license. He's defended his position in front of people who are now his peers at, at the expert level. So he's got a PhD in Islamic history, and it's got a, I can't even say eschatology without laughing. He's got a PhD from Ohio State. He is an expert in Islam, you know, has decades in this work. And how can, it's almost like, how can anything you say be incorrect if, if this is what your work is? And you're not basing things in farce or an opinion. You're actually basing them in fact. No. And in fact, I get flack from people on the right sometimes because I say things that some people don't write, don't like on my side of the fence. For instance, I mean, I've got I've been unfriended by people and attacked by who people I consider to be friends, for instance, by saying things like I don't think Iran wants a nuclear weapon to use on Israel. because I think the Iranians have more sense than that. You know, things like that. I mean, uh, so so I, I try. I mean, you know, I'm a human being. I'm not objective. I'm subjective. But I try to go where the data leads me. And uh you know, I've been, you know, Pete, I've been doing this for years and yeah. it's just ludicrous. I mean, I mean, look, uh, in many ways, Facebook is not a serious venue in many ways. Look, mostly what I put on Facebook is stuff about my kids' football games and stuff about family trips and things like that. But, you know, I do put political stuff up. Lots of my friends do. And, and, and a lot of my friends, many of whom, by the way, told me they went and complained to Facebook themselves about why was I banned. Of course, none of them got an answer at all. A lot of people like, you know, that I, that I post stuff, radio interviews I do and, and articles that I publish and stuff that I put there. So you reach a large audience for that and people appreciate it. So although in some ways it's more of an annoyance than anything, it, it's still it's still an annoyance that has real world effects. And. And, and again, as we talked about earlier, you don't see it happening to people on the other side of the fence. I, I don't know of any leftists who have been shut off of Facebook because they put up things that they didn't like or they put up things that someone didn't like. So, so there's a higher bar. I mean, they are kicked yeah. off, but for, for much worse stuff, I guess, is the yeah. idea. Yeah. Well, theoretically, anyway, yes. Yeah. It makes me wonder – I mean, Larry, you're in the business in the in – the, um, information business i mean wikipedia i'll see what's going on over at everpedia and those guys have been featured on the show a couple of times but how does how does a company expect to stay in business and and be as problem filled as like say facebook is with data i mean you just wrote a great blog about pulling your information increasingly and ultimately completely at some point off of of google and only only staying on because people use google docs and and there's a couple of minor things that you have to use. Yeah. I mean, that cannot be anyone at the top, at the C-suite level. That can't be their desired outcome is to have, have you say, I don't need nor do I want to have Google Calendar. Yeah. No, I, I – uh, uh, thanks for saying that. Well, more to the point, I deleted my Facebook page account entirely in in February. Partly it was due to concerns about uh, violations of privacy, which is another issue, of course, which is also very important, but uh, partly due to their, uh, you know, increasing incursions on 
free speech, or if you don't want to call it free speech, then let's just call it intellectual tolerance, creating a, a level playing field for uh, everyone. Um, and clearly, uh, a lot more people are going to follow my lead if I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't put it that way. I'm following a lot of other people's lead. A lot more people are going to be abandoning Facebook and Twitter and the rest if they continue to behave the way they are. If it's uh, if it becomes more and more obvious that that's what's going on, I I think it's just a, only a matter of time before they get uh, punished in the marketplace for it. And and for that matter, I think there's a good chance we will be able to use this as an opportunity to kickstart a more decentralized social media um, marketplace. Uh, there really needs to be, it should have been that way in the beginning, but, but uh, just when Twitter and Facebook were taking off and were loved by all and were thought to be the height of cool back in like the late 2000s or so that's just when they started shutting down their their networks so they didn't use um, neutral protocols that others could contribute to so let me tell you one thing that isn't possible right it is not possible for you to use some other website or tool and post a facebook um, post using that tool and then have it be distributed not just to Facebook but lots of other lots of other services. Now it, it is possible there are there are tools that allow you to um, individually um, quickly but still individually make posts to each of those different services. but you are adding to individual copies to the different databases that those represent. They're not actually drawing on your data. Therefore, you don't actually have control over the data. That's how it should be. That's, that's how email is. That's how the internet is. That's how uh, the blogosphere is. Um, if somebody uses a newsreader to look at um, uh, Usenet news groups, which still exist, then that's just, they're looking at something of which there are copies all over the place and nobody can really shut it down. And similarly, nobody can shut down your blog. Other people, unless they're using some sort of weirdly restrictive uh, blog reader, and anyone can add your uh, your blog to their blog role, your, their feed, right? That's how social media should have worked. And that's how I think it uh, it will work. And the more that these companies do this, the more that they're going to be driving us into this uh, sort of alternative social media um, uh, opportunities. Yeah, that sort of drives me to my next question. As we look at shadow banning and, and these ridiculous you know, blocks for when the bar isn't even, when the bar is higher from one side than the other, or just the inability or the refusal to communicate back, you know, like... Is is this going to be the flip phone? Like when you see a flip phone now in TVs and movies, you go like, "Oh, flip phone! There's one of those." Or, or nine seven six numbers. And will this just be like a cute old funny thing, where like it's just it was a product of its time, but we moved past? Because it does seem like with decentralized networks, Larry, that that this kind of problem will go away. We'll have a problem of more decentralization and harder to gather audiences in one big place like Facebook or Twitter, but. But that's a different problem altogether. Is that? Do you think that's going to happen? Are we going to in ten years? Are we, is this not even going to be a problem anymore? Um, I mean, nobody can predict the future. <laughs> but um, my my sense of the thing is that we are already now moving in in the direction of uh, decentralization. It's not just blockchain, um, although blockchain is definitely part of it. I'll. I'll I can give you a couple of pieces of evidence that that indicate that that we are moving in this direction. One is in the form of uh, Mark Zuckerberg's latest missive. 
in in which he talked about how we should regulate uh, himself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that uh, governments should start regulating social media and ensure that that uh, they respect privacy and um, among other things, he he suggested that they were going to use. Um, some sort of neutral protocols that would uh, enable uh, people to, well, uh, participate in Facebook from beyond Facebook. I'm I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. But uh, here's another piece of, of uh, uh, data. I gave a speech advocating for this idea of decentralized social media at South by Southwest a couple of weeks ago. I asked a question in in the speech, just out out in in public, not not directly to his face, but to Jack Dorsey. And the question was this: Will you allow people to post on other networks and have that uh, those posts served within people's feeds on Twitter? And will you also allow people to export automatically, regularly their uh, Twitter? posts, uh, their, their tweets, to uh, a neutral format that can be reposted on other uh, networks. And then finally, will you allow us to have greater control over our feeds so that uh, you're no longer basically paternalistically laying down the law about what we can and cannot see and, and uh, basically allowing us to to see the posts of, of friends who have been shadow banned um, and that kind of thing. And he actually responded and he said yes explicitly to all three questions. And later on, I, I talked to him on the phone. I, I won't give any details here, but he sort of laid out the plan that they have in mind, that they do have a plan. And it's got some interesting components, which I was frankly surprised by and again i'll believe it when i see it um but that some, does seem to be his plan so i think they're worried and they should be worried that that uh there is this major pushback by the tech community by the free speech loving parts of the internet which are still very numerous and strong you know, I think they're worried that there's going to be this pushback and they sort of need to get out in front of it or they're going to be swamped by new kinds of competitors. Tim, do you think these companies, and I, I agree with you there, I think Jack is willing to try to work on a very complex problem. And to be fair to him, there are, I don't know, 100 million voices trying to do things, some of them, a lot of them, nefarious i'm not saying the mass but there's a lot of people with bad intent and he's got to he's got to mind that almost before he can take care of peter van buren's banning or whatever but tim do you feel like is there anyone at facebook who understands islam at the level that you do and do they fear your message because you are contrary to what they believe or is I, what do you believe with all that I, you know, you're reading my mind, Pete, because I was going to ask Larry specifically, why do you think it is, to harken back to something I said earlier, why do you think it is that the the social media platforms are so solicitous of Islam in a way they aren't with any other religion or any other ideology except for, you know, so-called progressive politics? What do mm -hmm. I think about – and I'll ask Larry to go to that in a minute, but let me finish answering – try to answer you. I think – uh, at the risk of hubris, I seriously doubt there's anyone at, at Facebook that really knows jack squat about Islam, okay? And that's the thing that's particularly, uh, you know, disheartening to me, Pete. You know that, you know, I've done my time in this field and, and, and earned my stripes, and, and I don't, although I will, you know, I, I'll be tongue-in-cheek and I'll be sarcastic and I'll post things that can be offensive. I don't just post anything that I don't think any rational human being, I've never posted anything that any rational human being considered to be hate speech not by any stretch of the imagination. I am careful not to do that. And for the fact that I get caught up in some net where they're throwing me under the bus with, a, with people that do do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and again, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 
borderline libertarian and a strong proponent of the First Amendment, but I do also remember that thing about you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. So I'm not saying that anything should go, but if you can't even differentiate between a guy like me that's posting articles and posting factual data and bringing up things from Islamic history that are salient to what's going on today, and you're throwing me in a ban with people that are just putting up garbage that are hate, you've got a problem with your platform. And so anyway, and maybe that's too much to ask of a platform, but heck, I'm going to. So um, Larry, I want to ask you, what do you think? Why do you think it is? I mean, if you agree with me, it seems that the social media platforms, from my perspective, are certainly more overly solicitous, more def apologetic for, defensive of Islam than they are any other religion, certainly. And if you think that's true, I'm curious what you think about that. If you do, why do you think that is? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, you certainly know more about that than I do. I'm sure you've been paying a lot more attention to it. But that would definitely be my my um, impression. I, I think they do make some efforts. I, I'm aware that they have made some efforts to um, shut down the very worst of you know incitement to to terrorism basically mm. yeah uh, there definitely seems to be a double standard there's a lot of double standards and I, I don't even think that that you know the the establishment defenders of um, the excesses of big social media are even denying this anymore in the same way that that they they don't deny um, the way they used to, that the news is biased. Now, instead, the talking point is um, we uh, it, we will not support this spurious notion of of uh, false balance, right? That's that's what they say instead. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that sort of debate is is long over of course they're biased of course um there's a double standard and now the question is what are we going to do about it well that goes to what pete was saying earlier about how do you if you drive the conservatives and the christians off your social media you've sure driven away a lot of potential uh money making uh, uh possibilities i mean does yeah. is it the fact where you know, like, like sometimes I'll hear Rush talk about like the networks, the networks don't care like CNN's plummeting ratings. They don't care about their ratings. All they care now about is the SJW and anti-Trump agenda. Is that the point we're getting at with these social media platforms that they don't care about anything other than pushing their agenda at this point or you know, promoting those voices that do? I'm pretty sure they still want to keep making money. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. Well, everyone knows Republicans have money. You sure as hell don't want to run them off the platform. <laughs> right. No, no, you're not wrong about that either. I, I just think I think about how I think about the websites that I've started and, and, you know, conversations that I've had with different startup founders and so forth. Uh, Silicon Valley and the Internet were started by idealists, right? Um, a lot of the people who have who got into especially in the early days of the internet they they got into it um yeah probably because they're geeks and this is this is like uh the the uh cutting edge of of um networking and so forth but uh there was definitely a a, a sort of a political element to the internet and i i think it's gotten even more uh, so, um, it's just that the the politics of the people who are leading the way today uh, are less uh, libertarian and now more uh, liberal, and or I shouldn't say liberal. I should I should say progressive um, or leftist. Let's put it this way. I mean, it's it is a recurring phenomenon throughout the last couple of centuries of history, I believe, that when some institution gains the ascendancy, then the left descends and <laughs> um, and and uh, tries to basically wrest control. And they're, they're attracted to power and that they will use uh, the, the new tools that they have to advance their agenda. They feel very strongly about it. Uh, it 
it's not unlike the motives of a lot of journalists. I've talked to a number of journalists in the last last few years. One of the things I like to ask them about, um, a debate with them about, is the notion of neutrality, of viewpoint neutrality in journalism. And very, very few journalists that I've ever talked to will actually um, defend it or even regard it as worth debating very much. Clearly, they are motivated by a desire to change the world, not to impart information. Or in the case of the social uh, networks, they're not motivated no, motivated by a desire to, you know, bring together long lost friends and family members and and uh, you know grease the wheels of, of civil society in a responsible way. Nope, it, it, it all has to do with advancing their political cause. That's what really gets them out of bed in the morning. And why, why wouldn't you think that? Just look at how these people actually believe and just think about yourself and how how important you think politics are. You think it's all about money? Of course, it's not all about money. So the agenda takes precedence here. Yeah. It's not it's a matter of fostering, fostering to informed debate on both sides like we like to think, like probably too many of us on the right naively think. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's put it this way. If if it really does start looking like there is a significant threat from a, a freer kind of social media such, such that it would cut into their profits, then, yeah, then they're, they're going to start making real moves to head it off. I think that's why facebook and 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 twitter both have sent out these signals that they're they want to be involved in the next iteration of social media but the one that is newly decentralized yeah the decentralization stuff is is really an interesting part of this uh, i did want to ask you larry as someone who started and has worked at the c-suite level at, at technology companies when you guys are having these early conversations how much of it is like let's advance our political agenda or let's create a space you know like that part of the conversation early on like you have these big dreams and these big outcomes mm -hmm. what percentage of that is stuff that's like this is just the natural cone expanding out from this original idea like wikipedia starts out as open and and ends up not being as open as maybe a lot of us would like how do, yeah can you talk about that sure well i mean Wikipedia, I can speak only about my own motives. I can't necessarily speak about um, how Jimmy Wales uh, thought about it. I can tell you what he said, but that isn't necessarily a reflection of what he thought. Right. I mean, I just loved the idea that there would be potentially uh, the biggest, most active and free reference work available all around the world, available to educate the world. The, the sharing of knowledge is a stunningly powerful idea. I think even today, people don't really understand how important it is and, and uh, what a revolutionary thing it is going to be in the future, not now, in the future. I think it's going to get even better than, than Wikipedia indicates than our experience with, with uh, Wikipedia would, would indicate. So, yeah, I mean, and that's what motivates me. That's what motivated me in the beginning. In the beginning, uh, Wikipedia was going to be a for-profit. Uh, I, actually, I should say the predecessor of Wikipedia, Newpedia, um, was uh, newpedia.com. And when Wikipedia was launched, it was wikipedia.com. I think to some extent, Jimmy Wales was, was uh, you know, in it for the money. But I think he also probably sincerely had some of the same sort of civic minded motives. Yeah, but then, then when there was all this pushback from volunteers, basically, Jimmy Wales, this is after I, after I left or about the time when I left, actually, there's this pushback from volunteers. They did not want their work to be the source of profit, of corporate profit from, uh, you know, the the Wikipedia company, which was called Bombus. 
uh, yeah, basically, um, Jimmy Wales, after a, a year or two, decided to make Wikipedia a nonprofit. And that's actually something we discussed in toward the beginning. So I actually think that that Wikipedia is not a great example. I mean, my understanding of, of how Facebook got started, um, maybe you guys know more about this than I do. Basically, they they just wanted to make a, a site that enabled college students to connect and, you know, uh, evaluate each other on appearance. Um, I don't know. Just um, uh, basically, I remember um, when it first started coming out, it was a MySpace for college students. That's how it was understood. And it just seemed like, uh, sure, it was a money making operation, but it seemed to be motivated at the time by just connecting people. But I can't actually speak because I've never really uh, looked into uh, what uh, the motives of, of Zuckerberg and his fellows were. It does seem reasonable that this thing can get out of control real quick. I mean, what yeah. CEO that young, that experienced in, in so many of these cases? I mean, look, of these CEOs, I, I, have, I have news for a lot of these startup companies. Having an open bar in your company is a bad idea. It was a bad idea 50 years ago. It's going to continue to be a bad idea. But <laughs> they just they don't know some of these things and have to relearn these things. I can absolutely see when all of a sudden you've got 100 million people on your platform and you grow, grow, grow all the time, that you can find yourself in a situation where you're like, how on earth did we end up here, you know? Mm-hmm. Right, right. I... I, I'm actually quite serious when I when I say that these companies basically were were discovered and then became the targets essentially of uh, activists who who viewed them as um, excellent new tools and platforms to you know change the world and, and that's that's what it's all about for them. I, I saw that going on even um, the early days of, of Wikipedia. Yeah, it was already going on then. Sort of move on into a different category, different topic. You know, we have experts out there, right? Someone like Tim, someone like you. Are we, I hate to say the left because that just seems so, I don't know, that just seems too easy. But are we afraid of expertise now? Or do we think because we have so much access to so much information? And this, this question is for either of you. When someone has a PhD behind, it's definitely easier now to get a PhD than ever before. Um, do we just are we just not willing to give up the fact that Tim has worked for decades in his craft in his field? Well, at the risk of having admitted, I haven't f finished reading Tom Nichols's book. Right, Tom's book, The Death of Expertise. You're familiar right. with that, Larry? Yeah, um, I, I actually talked to him a little bit before yeah. it was published. Yep. Yeah. I think, and I want to bring in a couple of things other that have happened to me that I mentioned to Pete I wanted to talk about, where I think, again, this is not just a, what we're talking about is not just a phenomenon of social media platform and not just of Silicon Valley, although that's where the rubber really hits the road because they control a lot of people's access to each other and social media on the internet and such. Like, for instance, you know, about 10 years ago, I interviewed for a job here at the university, Kennesaw State University, for a Middle East history position. They were creating a Middle East history position. And I went over there and interviewed and uh, was one of three finalists. And, at the, uh, and I could not believe some of the garbage that came out at the end of the day when I met back with the search committee at the end of the day. People flat out said to me, you're too conservative to work here. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, I came home to my wife, who's an attorney, and I said, are you allowed to say you're too liberal or too gay or too old or too whatever? Right. No, but you can say you're too conservative to someone. Um, yep. It was ludicrous. And the basis of this was that I had published an article in Middle East Quarterly about beheading in Islam. And Pete, I know you read that article. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's pretty scholarly. It breaks down the Islamic sources on beheading and decapitation. And I didn't make any of it up. <laughs> uh, but that was but, but actually doing research in primary sources and then and, and then publishing that is deemed conservative by some places. Um, I used to have regular lecturing jobs at, at two um two government entities. One was the Federal Law Enforcement Trading Center, which is down here in uh, Glencoe, Georgia, Brunswick, Georgia, down uh, south of Savannah. It's a main training facility for uh, Homeland Security people. I used to lecture regularly there. I also used to 
lecture fairly regularly at Joint Special Operations University, both when it was at uh, both when it was in. Uh... This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one. Consult others to build their own and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at John LG 69 at the break it down show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Was it uh, both when it was in, um, Oh gosh, what's that little dinky air force base and North the panhandle. I can't even remember what it was. Herbert field. It was at Herbert field for a while. If you know that Pete. Yeah. They finally moved it to Tampa just outside the gate of uh, McDill. But anyway, joint special ops university. I used to lecture both these places, both these places, I got my positions cut because I was told, by the way, at Joint Special Ops University, I used to lecture right after Seb Gorka. Uh, we did a block of instruction together, him and then me. But, but I was told at both places uh, that this was, uh, you know, this was under the Obama administration, mind you. But basically, I was told we are allowed to employ anybody that uses the term jihad and talking about counterintelligence training, which I think I may have alluded to when we started here. So you've got that. You've got stuff like I just published an article in the stream last month or maybe it was March about Amazon, Books A Million, and um, Barnes & Noble all banning that Tommy Robinson book called Muhammad's Quran, which, mm. you know, I, I'm not a big fan of Tommy Robinson, but the book, there's really, the book is a bit strident, but the yeah. book doesn't say anything that I don't say in my books and in my research. Perhaps I'm at, I say it a little bit more diplomatically. But, but you know, we have gotten to this point again where overall, I mean, the meta question here is the meta issue is just bias as, as Larry's been talking about so eloquently uh, just bias in terms of pro-social uh, justice well it used to be I guess we used to think it was libertarian now it's just liberal or, or left uh, a good friend of mine is professor monitoring Institute Jeffrey Bale says please please don't, don't call those I'm a liberal he says don't call me a liberal those people are leftists or <laughs> progressives. Don't confuse the two. Yeah, okay, right. fair enough. Um, so, Jeffrey, if you hear this, I, I stood up for you. Um, but but hmm. that's the meta question. But more specifically, again, to, to, to go back to my field of expertise and my, my particular experience, I just see across all kinds of entities in the government, um, in the, I mean, it's less so with Trump and the government, but it's still there, uh, you know, in the media. Uh, in these social media platforms, we have for by people who are not members of the world's second largest religion, people that are flat out defending, apologizing for, uh, and sometimes even seeking to uh, advance a religion to which they do not belong. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a religion which, by the way, according to the State Department, uh, transnational terrorist list is responsible for 76% of the transnational terrorist groups in the world. I mean, they can complain and bitch about Nazis all day long, but I just checked the list again recently. There are no Nazi groups on that list. I'm going to have to ban you, Tim. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> wow. I, I just find this very problematic because I, and again, when, when this, when you align this with all of this, all of these constant, incessant attacks with people like, you know, candidates running for president on the Democratic side who are now saying that we should we should basically deplatform Thomas Jefferson. I mean, isn't that what Buttigieg just said recently? Thomas yeah. Jefferson is problematic. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we dug up John Wayne and called him a, uh, a homophobe bigot. <laughs> like, well, John's, John Wayne's been that for a long time. We know that. But, but you know, <laughs> the man that wrote the Declaration of Independence is now problematic. Yeah. Uh, so on one hand, we have these incessant yeah. attacks on Western civilization and, frankly, as a Christian, incessant attacks on Christianity by these media moguls and their platforms and, 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 their, and their accomplices in the media. And then we also have, on the other hand, and it's and again, I know you guys both use the term double standard, and I think that's necessary, but I don't think that's sufficient to explain what's going on. This is not just a double standard. This is active promotion of one ideology, one religion over others, and I find it just – very, very troublesome for our society. I I doubt that that um, like the uh, the EU or military establishment or whatever, or, or the Democrats for that, for that matter, 
desperately want to advance the cause of, you know, Islamism. I, of course they don't. Um, I don't think Barry, that's I'm not what sure you're I agree saying you. Look at Ilhan Omar. Okay. What have they ever said to Ilhan Omar? They defend her at every turn. Sure, 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 sure. But the question is why? Um, and I think the 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 answer is, I, I mean, if you actually look at the at the real beliefs to the extent that they have any of uh, our, our sophisticated coastal elites, then they tend to be uh, very much socially liberal and uh, fiscally uh, liberal uh, or or leftist. And when it comes to philosophy in general, they, they tend to be pretty nihilistic. In any event, if they have any sort of spiritualism, it tends to be either a very woo sort of, you know, made up religions or some watered down version of Christianity or Judaism or Islam. They, they aren't. So if there is a, an agenda here, and I I agree with you, I think there is, it isn't to advance the cause of Islam, it's to, it's to undermine Western civilization, because okay. there's just so much, uh, so much damage has been done by it. They, they sincerely believe that, that, that uh, colonialism is uh, has basically uh, destroyed life in in the developing world. That that most of our our institutions continue to be racist and sexist and so forth. And uh, they could just taste the the in the, the coming equalization of society. It's like we seem to be so close in their minds to the socialist utopia, the egalitarian utopia. They're, they're getting very excited and doing everything that they can to bring it about. Um, I, can, I can sum it up in one word for you, Larry. I think it's called guilt. They have been inculcated for years. As you said, Western civilization is the worst thing to happen to the world. You know, I remember a while back when we had this spate of, um, it's still around some, but we had this spate of, uh, you know, uh, accusing people of cultural appropriation things, right? Oh boy. I mean, I couldn't, you couldn't have taco lunch day. It was a cultural appropriation. And, 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 and we're, we're getting these, of course, these, these attacks on white this and white that. Any group should be defended, but anybody that's white. And I, and I remember tweeting on Twitter, and I, hey, I'm still on Twitter for this too, Pete. <laughs> I said, well, then if you're going to not allow any of that cultural appropriation, then you need to stop using all the stuff white people invented, like airplanes and penicillin and computers. Can you give up those? Because you're culturally appropriating those. <laughs> I, no, I think, I think, yes, I think, Larry, you're, you, you put it a little better than I did, perhaps. And, and what I would say also, I would add to that, too, it's not just an attack on Western civilization. I think it's clearly an attack on Christianity. And, and I have my theories on that. My theories are that the left... Going back to the Enlightenment, of course, uh, where the Christian Church in general and the Catholic Church in particular was seen as the enemy. I think that's the origination of it. I think it gets ramped up. It gets knocked up a, a level uh, uh, by Marx and by the neo-Marxists. Uh, and now it's become the point that Western civilization is seen as coterminous with Christianity, and they're both equally bad. Of course, this is a to, to, to call this a one-dimensional view of history is to do it uh, not even to do it justice, of course. Um, I remember that I mentioned earlier when I had that interview years ago at that position and they didn't hire me because I was quote unquote too conservative. One thing I talked about, and I just remember looking around at these people who had the deer in the headlights. I mean, literally there was, there was drool coming off their chins when I was trying to explain to them, you do realize that, that Westerners aren't the only people in history that have ever been imperialists, you know? Uh, but, but, you know, this is, even if they are like aware of that historically, it doesn't comport with their, with their agenda, so they're not going to acknowledge it. I mean, you know, hey, you know, the Arabs often thought the Ottomans were imperialists, but you know, I uh, can't say that. Um, so I think you're right. I think it's, but 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 basically, what we have is, you know, I teach world history. I, I can't think of a civilization in history that was sawing off the limb of its own, uh, 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 its own roots 
the way that our civilization tends to be doing. I mean, this is civilization for all of its faults that has given women's rights and created secular republics and those things that I mentioned earlier, like penicillin and airplanes and computers and the yeah. Constitution of the United States and things like that. But yet these people, rich, wealthy, ostensibly intelligent people in places like Silicon Valley like to spend all day trying to find ways to undermine their, this own, this civilization that allow them to do what they do. I just find this, this is just remarkable. I wish I could listen in on, on uh, discussions uh, among, I, I don't know, uh, the corporate CEOs, the Democratic Party leaders, the uh, top uh, academics and uh, think tank presidents and so forth and and um it, just to understand exactly how they sincerely think about this and you know uh it it resembles nihilism nothing so much as as uh, simple nihilism huh. but uh, you also have to bear in mind that these very same people uh, th think nothing of and actually take great pride in traveling around the world and patronizing businesses that that uh, cater only to uh, their fellow elites mm -hmm. if they are elite uh, but I am talking about the the, the, the power elite here uh, I mean and and uh, they really like I think I get the sense that they like the fact that they can go into uh, a hotel on the other side of the world and get the same sort of service that they get from a, a, a five-star hotel in the United States or in London, that everybody speaks English. They don't regard their, I don't think they th see the evidence of civilization level threat that maybe you and I do in their day-to-day -day lives because, you know, they know they support all of that stuff. Um, it's not going to go away. Yeah. And uh, just because we shut up a few conservatives, aren't we just like blowing it all out of proportion? That, that's, that, of course, is what, what they say. I'm just being a little bit of the, the uh, devil's advocate, but I'm a, I'm a philosopher, so I do that. <laughs> but you know, being that devil's advocate, though, it, it does appear that, and, and maybe this is because of uh, I don't know some DNA based wiring where half of us want to approach a problem from one way and half want to do the other thing. But you talked about utopia and egalitarianism. How many of these CEOs have a command of Thomas More and, and know who the heck Raphael Hathaway even is? And, and how, if you're going to claim to be smarter than Thomas More, then you're not an intelligent person in my book, because we all know from the Greeks going back, philosophy especially, like the, the more we know, the, like, the less smart we are, like the less, the more we realize how vast all of this stuff is and the challenges of just cutting out segments of, of intelligent voices. I'd rather people work on tolerance and being able to accept the challenge of reading Tim's paper, an academic paper, way harder to read than a white paper. And white papers, as you know, they're in your field, with the, especially with blockchain stuff, are exceptionally hard to read. Yeah, to, sure they are. To read a high-level academic paper, you better be prepared to read 50 different papers to truly grasp what's being said in these things. Pete, no one wants to read a white paper. Come on. <laughs> Right, but, th but these are the challenges I think that are before us. These are exceptionally complicated problems, and we don't need less people involved in trying to figure them out. Tim's got a very good voice. He brings up problems you have to deal with because they're founded in reality. You may not like the taste of it. It may make you uncomfortable, but, but I would submit that that's where the learning is. If you're not uncomfortable all the time reading things and sharing these things, then you're likely selling your intellect short. And uh, I don't like to sell my intellect short. Mm -hmm. uh, well said, Pete. And uh, I mean, not just me, but lots of other people. I mean, look, I I, I, I sometimes grit my teeth and uh, watch MSNBC or even listen to NPR occasionally, which I used to listen to religiously before it went way to the uh, other side. But uh, that's the thing. I mean, are we going to have – I mean, people, people have been talking for years, right, about the balkanization of media and the balkanization of news and – Conservatives all watch Fox and liberals all watch CNN or MSNBC. Um, I mean, is this is this what's going to happen with social media now? Uh, because if it does, it's 
it's not not only is it sad for uh, political discourse uh, and will can further contribute to political balkanization, but you will have people that are woefully underinformed, and we've got way too many of those people already, thanks to public schools. Let me just say this: that we're talking with Larry Sanger, and you can go get more of Larry's work on his blog at LarrySanger.org. Ta- definitely talk to him on Twitter. He's on Twitter all the time at L Sanger. If you have trouble finding him, absolutely hit me up, and I will connect you to him. And then, of course, Tim's great work is at OccidentalJihad.com. Same thing for his. Uh, same thing for your your Twitter handle, right? Occidental Jihad. Yes, sir. And, and these guys are. I mean, this is this is part of how you have. This is how you have the conversation. You want to understand what blockchain and decentralization are doing. You have to understand Larry's work. You just have to because that's he's one of the critical nodes in this whole thing. There's a whole bunch of other nodes out there, but you can start there and look what he's already built in his career. He's a value to all of us that are trying to be smarter. And Tim, anytime mm-hmm. you want to come on and talk Islam, we just had uh, today's episode that's going to go up. Basically, when I hang up with you guys, it's called Mosul, and it's about Daesh's attack on Mosul and the retaking by the uh, by the conglomerate of Iraqi troops with the helps from Americans. And you can't watch that film and then look at well, our reality is here in America and think that we've got problems on that order. The Zul mm. is, is the second largest city in, in Iraq, and it is wrecked to this day. And the kind of wrecking that just will break your heart. So mm. there's, there's big problems out there in the world to solve. And, and tuning out Tim's voice or, or denying people freedom of speech, I'll just say from my own soapbox, because this is it, I, I, don't, I don't support that because I see what happens down the road. When uh, when one one group wants to put down another group, and it's not just shadow blocking or or uh, deplatforming anymore. Yep. If you uh, if your listeners want to go to my blog and and search for uh, free speech credo, or just search for uh, Larry Sanger free speech credo, I would appreciate it if they would uh, you know read it and and share it. I've tried to summarize um, basically the the uh thinking uh, some of the most important arguments um in a very readable um tweetable kind of form that uh well i it, it started going viral um actually when I, it's uh the biggest tweet that i have had basically um is in promotion of that it definitely uh struck a nerve when I posted it and and started basically saying, "Hey, it's actually okay to defend defend free speech," um, they they cannot legitimately accuse you of being racist just because you are defending the principle of free speech. Um, that's and if, if you allow yourself to be cowed because you don't want to to get that label, then it really is game over. So if there's one point where we have to draw the line, it is at uh, our moral right to defend our rights. And free speech is a right. Um, let's not forget that. It's maybe the most important right, one of the most important rights. It's highly moral to defend it. It's, uh, I would argue, even moral to defend it for for. Uh, the sorts of racists that I find to be themselves morally abhorrent, but uh, you have to defend their right to speak um, if you want to defend the principle. And if, otherwise, you have to start drawing the line at what is considered hate speech um, and what is not. That is absolutely notorious. Um, there is no principled way to draw the distinction because people hate different things and people are willing to countenance angry expressions and rejections of uh, things based on uh, differing values. Yeah, I, I think it's it's time that we uh, we start throwing back this uh, growing culture of censorship in in the faces of the social media giants. I don't think Thomas Jefferson would have agreed that there's even such a thing as hate speech, but yet we see where he stands in the modern Democrat Party and on the left these days. Yeah. Well, (laughs) there.
<laughs> there is that. Yeah, it turns out everybody's a uh, everybody. When you get into anybody's uh, life and their actions and their words, there's a whole bunch of uh, disagreement. You know, Abe Lincoln has some real shitty things that he said along the way. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You want to stop watching TV because there's about 15 Sherlock Holmes uh, characters out there. Well, you can go ahead and read his books and understand just you know how how well his words don't line up with today's uh, morality. So. Or we can't talk about Robert E. Lee. We can't even say Robert E. Lee was a great military mind, which, of course, anybody with two IQ digits knows because he fought for the Confederacy, as, as if that somehow affects his military strategy. All right. Fellas, thank you so much. I've had you for an hour, and I don't want to uh, waste your time. I know you guys are, have things to do, and I really appreciate us having this conversation. I think it goes to exactly what we've been talking about. Let's have a conversation that can be a little challenging to have. Let people listen to it and, and give them a chance to have some just candid, rational thought for a change. So thank you for uh, joining me with that. Bellis. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate you uh, having me on. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah.